I deeply appreciate the response there has been to this day. This is the fifth meeting today. The only thing that is troubling me just now is, I wonder if through the last number of years we have been wrong in that we have not preached creation to the degree we should have. I would have to confess that that's a that, that has been my own way of doing just preaching the gospel. But we live in a day when there is so much that would attack people's confidence in the word of God that perhaps we have failed to understand the difference in our time even I began to preach over 50 years ago and I would have to tell you that what I have seen in that short period of time is tremendous the different attitude the fear of God not found in many many people as it once was the belief in the Bible now it's almost the exception but it used to be almost the rule that people believe the Bible so we live in a different day and perhaps we have not been sensitive enough to apply the message to the needs of our time that's something we need to think about so tonight we're going to look at at least the beginning of Genesis 1 we haven't done this as yet we've referred to many things in these opening verses but we haven't actually looked at the verses now Genesis as all of you know is the most important book in the Bible I know you could get a debate from many people on that uh, some would tell you the Gospel of John is some would tell you the book of Hebrews is some would tell you the Revelation is and so on but there is a sense in which the book of Genesis is the most important book in all the Bible because of course as you know it is the book of beginnings if you took Genesis out of the Bible the rest would be incomprehensible if you took the fall out of the Bible the fall of man the whole world would be incomprehensible the earth in which we live would cease to have any verification for its existence and for the disorder that is in it so Genesis is all important if we're going to understand the Bible now if you look at the book of origins this is what you discover in this first book of the Bible you have the origin of the universe and of course you have the origin of order the origin of energy the origin of forces that shape the universe in fact what you have in Genesis is the not only the creation of the solar system but you have actually the creation of time itself please understand that time is a creation of God and God created time so all that we know of our earth the atmosphere the biosphere life itself man even marriage sin and evil Satan language as we pointed out this afternoon government culture nations religion they all have their origin in this book of origins so no wonder Satan has made such a concerted attack against the book of Genesis if Satan can convince people that they don't know where they came from he doesn't have a great deal of difficulty in teaching them that they can't know where they're going to so Satan's attack against the scriptures has been very strong no wonder then that uh, Michael Denton has said that the voyage of the Beagle in 1831 is the most important voyage ever taken by sea of course the voyage of that Beagle around the world was Darwin's exploratory voyage in which he put together his theory of evolution which he produced in his book in 1859 called The Origin of the Species by Natural Selection I've read so many descriptions of natural selection that I, I almost have to smile when I see a new one you need a powerful imagination to imagine that natural selection has produced this world but be that as it may the simple fact is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth 
We read earlier today that in the book of Exodus in chapter 20 and chapter 31, we are told in six days God made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Do you believe that? There's no reason not to believe it. We have been pointing out through this day that there is no evidence in the fossil record. There is no evidence in the geologic column. There is no evidence in nature of any of the things that uniformitarians in geology or evolutionists in biology teach. They have begun with the presupposition that there is no God. And because there is no God, they have been able to accept theories without hardly a shred of evidence to support them. And when you dismiss God, here's what happens. Think of a pyramid with me just for a moment. And a pyramid has a top stone, doesn't it? It has layers of stones beneath that top stone until you have the base layer, the foundation of the pyramid. Now, that is a picture to us. It helps to understand. If you remove God from the top, everything below ceases to have meaning. In fact, there can be nothing but chaos in the minds of men and women when you dismiss God. You see, what we said earlier today was that here you have matter that came into being at a particular point in time. Scientists generally do not believe that matter is eternal. The law of entropy said it had a beginning, it is getting older, and therefore you have matter coming into being. How did it come into being? You have life. How did life begin? This is what we've been going over today. And we have, we have tried to show you that uh, Louis Pasteur and almost every biologist that has ever followed him agrees that biogenesis is the only means by which life can begin. What does that mean? That life begins life. And we have tried to show you what the complexity of our, of our physical life is. Tried to show you that, that one single life cell that has DNA and the ability to replicate itself, that one single living cell in our bodies is so complex, has such a tremendous structure, can only be put together in the way that it is constructed, with actually millions of possibilities of it being constructed wrongly. No wonder men haven't been able to produce life in a laboratory. The complexity of it is staggering. What a complex thing life is. It makes us humble when we think of the mighty power of God. That's why I read Isaiah 40. Think of a hand that measured the waters of the ocean. Now, I know bigness has very little meaning in eternity. You see, in our little world, size and has such a lot of meaning to us. But I don't think bigness in itself has, has very much meaning. But, but think of the power of a hand that can measure the waters of the ocean. Think of the mighty Pacific. Think of the great Atlantic. Think of a hand that can measure the waters and find that there's just exactly enough and then put those waters upon the earth. Think of a hand that actually measured the mountains. Think of a hand that actually spanned the universe. What a hand. And what touches me most is that very hand was pierced with a nail. That's the hand that made heaven and earth. The Lord God will come with strong hand. His arms shall rule for him. He feeds his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs with his arms. He gently leads those that are, who are with young. Who is that? The Lord Jesus Christ. God's blessed Son, our Savior, and our Lord. What a creation. What a mighty work. Now, there are problems. I said that uh, the heavens and the earth and all that in them were made in six days. 
That's what it says. And although I've spent my lifetime in these kind of pursuits, <laughs> I've never found anything to contradict that. So I, I believe it. Made in six days. Oh, but they were, those days were like ages, weren't they? Doesn't it say in Second uh, Peter chapter 3 that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day? So what does that say? Is that 2,000 years? What, what if I told you that that's 1,000 years in one day? That verse isn't saying anything about God making a day into 1,000 years. You know what that verse is saying? That God is beyond time. That, that God is the God of eternity. He is the everlasting God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. What it really is saying is that God is the eternal now. With us, we have great difficulty. You see, I, we live in this particular point at uh, six minutes to seven on this fifth day of December, 1998. At this particular point, we can't see what's before us. We have memory of what's behind us. We only live for this moment. So in us, there are, in our, our thinking, there is future, past, and present. Can we then understand a God who doesn't see like that at all? Who is the eternal now? That's why it says in the book of the Revelation, He is. That's where it starts. You would never make a description of anybody like that. You always go from past to future, at least I do. But it says who is. He eternally is. That's why it says in Revelation 1 and 18, I am the living one. He eternally lives. He became dead. He is alive forevermore. So, what we are dealing with is something beyond our comprehension. Is God greater than our comprehension? He surely is. Let me tell you what that means. Men didn't make him. If men had invented the God we know... He certain, they certainly would have invented a God they understand. They would have invented a God that suits their lifestyle and their desires, even their, even their sinful desires. No, here's a God who dwells in unsullied light that no man can approach onto. Here's a God whom no man has seen or can see. Here's the God who is immortal, eternal light. Here is the God who is Trinity. Do you understand the Trinity? I believe it, but I don't understand the Trinity. God transcends our highest thought. When we say God is infinite, we mean we cannot measure Him. When we say God is transcendent, we mean that God is beyond our highest thought. All we've ever said about God and about Christ, and He is God. Did you hear that? Christ is God. And all we have ever said about Him, and all the scriptures ever say about Him, and all we have ever learned of the glories of his person and the beauty of his holiness, all of it together doesn't add up to what he is. He is higher, greater, holier, mightier, more majestic than anything we could ever think or say about his blessed person. Here's, here is a person who cannot be exaggerated. And we read today in John 1 that by him were all things made that were made. Now the six days of creation are very interesting <clears throat> because on three days there was a forming and on three days there was a filling. The first day of creation God divided the light from the darkness. The second day God divided the waters beneath from the waters above. On the third day God divided the seas from the dry lands and then he began to fill that creation. So that you have grass, herbs, trees, fruit, sun, moon, stars, life in the waters, winged fowls, whales, cattle, creeping things, beasts, and finally man. Now I'm going to tell you something which is not usually said. Uh, none of that fits the evolutionary picture of how all things began. But let me show you the difference, if I can, just very quickly. In the creation order... You have earth before sun and stars. Yes, you do. You might not like that. You might not agree with that. That's what the Bible says. The earth was before sun and stars. Of course, the evolutionary theory is that the sun and stars existed long before the earth. In the Genesis record, the oceans appeared before the land. 
But of course, in the evolutionary geological uniformity uh, story, the land be appeared before the water. Actually, in the Genesis record, light appeared before the sun, moon, and stars. <laughs> You're going to have a problem with that, aren't you? Maybe I can help you. In the evolutionary order, the sun was the first light. Uh, in Genesis, the plants appeared before marine life. Of course, in the evolutionary story, marine organisms were far ahead. In the Genesis story, it actually tells us the plants existed before the sun. Of course, that's not possible in the evolutionary scheme. The sun was before the plants. In Genesis, the, beast, the birds appeared before insects. But, of course, in evolution, insects were far before birds. In Genesis, man was before woman. In the evolutionary scale, woman was before man. That's why in that uh, Congress of Genetics in uh, Chicago, Illinois, in 1992, they said they had the evolutionary Eve. She was the first. And they even dared to say that there was only one mother of all races, which, of course, the Bible teaches. But the reason they, they had the evolutionary Eve is because evolution believes that woman came before man. That's not what Genesis says. Now, why am I doing this? Uh, because I want to show you that it's an awful blunder to try to fit human theory into Genesis 1. It just doesn't work. Now, I'm going to go over a couple of verses with you here as quickly as I can. But seeing I've already mentioned some very strange things... That, for instance, uh, light was created before there were sun, moon, and stars. Okay, let me ask, answer the question which I raised this afternoon. There are stars. In fact, there are galaxies, star systems, that are said to be at a distance from our Earth of actually millions of light years. And if they are that far removed... And the light has been coming toward our Earth for all that length of time. Light travels at 176,000 miles a second. So if they're that far removed, how do we see the light of them? If the Earth is only as old as what I am contending it is from Genesis 1. You know the answer to that? Well, actually, there are several answers. Today we said that when God created plant life, for instance, when he created trees, he did not create seeds. He created trees. Trees, of course, have evidence of growth. Trees have evidence of age. They are mature. Therefore, when God created uh, what we know in our physical world, it did. Now, God is not deceiving anybody. You understand that? God is not making it look like it has age and it doesn't. Let me ask you a question. If you saw Adam one hour after he was created, and he said, you said to him, how long have you been here, Adam? And he said, one hour. And where were you before? I didn't exist. I just created an hour ago. How can that be? You're a, you're a fully mature man. Well, that's the way God made me. So very clearly, that's the way God made creation. But, you say, what about the light from those stars? Well, this is an amazing thing. God is light. God is light. He is the uncreated light. And God said, let there be light on this physical creation. And there was light. And then, later on, God created the sun and the moon and the stars. What am I saying? I'm saying that God created the light before he created the permanent sources of light. That isn't as difficult as what we think. It's just that we have our minds made up in a different way. All we know about light comes from light sources. But uh, it, it's a little bit like this. God created the light, and then he put the energy to maintain the light. When God created the stars and the sun and the moon, God allowed that light to be seen from earth immediately. I've had this question asked me many times. I must well bring it up right now. Is the universe finite? 
By finite, I mean, is it limited? I believe it has to be. Do you know why? Because time and space are not infinite. You see, time and space are just two ways of expressing the same thing. When, when you come to astronomy, uh, time and space are not different elements. They're actually the same. So, do we have a limitless universe? It cannot be. Seeing it is actually finite and someday will get old and be rolled up like a garment and pass away. And when the great white throne is set, in Revelation 20, the heavens and earth flee from before the face of him who sits on the throne. So therefore, we have a finite universe. If you were to ask a hundred astronomers, if there are limits to the universe, what lies beyond the limits, they could not tell you. That's not an answer that men have. They don't even profess to be able to tell you. I've heard them say this. We don't know. So there are things that men don't know. Even though they spend their lifetime in the physical realm and examine the, the, the heavenly bodies constantly, and the Hubble telescope has done so much to actually increase the knowledge of the heavenly bodies. And one thing the Hubble telescope has done is to, is to question a great many of the so-called assured results of science that men have thought were so settled and about which they knew so much. It's humbling, really. But let me go to creation itself just for a moment. The word create, as all of you know, that is used in Genesis 1 and 1, is the word bara. It means to make from nothing. So when God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't create them from existing materials. He created them from nothing. Now there is another word. In fact, there are two other words that are used in uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, one of them is a word that is translated make, and the other is a word that is translated form. Those two words, create is bara. The other two words, of course, are asa, and yatsa is a word that means to form. Some of you have been told that the only time that God made from nothing, anything in Genesis 1, is at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that word is not used again until you come to the creation of great whales and then, of course, God created man. Now, is that true? That the word bara is the only word here that means create? Let me tell you what has been written about this. The verb create, bara, is a profound theological term. It only has one meaning. God is its subject on every occasion when it is used. Because only God can create. Only God can make from nothing. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The other words that are used are words of lesser meaning. But now here's the point. The word bara literally means to make from nothing. Exactly the same. This word, Asa, is used a number of times in our Old Testament. And each time that it is used, it has its own meaning. But that's the way we understand words, by their context and the way in which they are used. This statement is from W.E. Vine. He says, Whether or not the firmament was made of existing materials cannot be determined since the passage uses only asa, but it is clear that the verb expresses creation since it is used in the context and follows the technical word bara. So Asa must mean creation from nothing. Since it is used as a synonym for bara, let us make man in our own image, that's Asa, after our likeness, so God created man in his own image, bara. So God uses them interchangeably, and therefore that great story about how made in Genesis 1 does not mean create, according to the Hebrew scholars, it doesn't hold water. Now, I, I think all of us recognize that uh, we are dependent upon scholars to tell us the meaning of the language of the Old Testament and New Testament. So, Mr. Vine says, the unusual juxtaposition of Bara and Asa refers to the totality of creation, and there is no difference between the word Bara and Asa as it is found in Genesis chapter 1. That kind of uh, changes 
what many have told us and what I myself uh, thought for a long time that uh, in the beginning God created from nothing but then the rest of it was like setting in order what had already been created so let me look at now the creation just with you for a few minutes just to see exactly what this is saying it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth the next thing we need to know is what are the heavens what is the earth is that the creation of the stars is that the creation of all the heavenly bodies God created the heavens why then would it say later on in this chapter that God created the stars and the moon and the sun why would it say that if he already has done that in verse 1 why would he do it again of course the explanation has been that there was a terrible catastrophe that came in between verses 1 and 2 called the gap theory and that God had to bring out of this terrible chaos and destruction this formless void universe God had to reorder it and reconstruct it and make it again a second creation I'm not going to quarrel with you if you believe that I, I'm just telling you that uh, there is every reason to discredit it my first problem with that theory came about by reading the writings of a man by the name of Dr. Edward Young Dr. Edward Young is a famous Hebraist a Hebrew scholar Dr. Young was pointing out that the first sentence of the Bible has four clauses that the three clauses that follow the first clause are dependent on the first clause that the grammar actually says that these four things happened in sequence and are all related there is not some great gap between that was my first shock I, I thought maybe Dr. Young's wrong and uh, my next problem came about that uh, I began to realize there's two million years of death and decay before Adam if I believe this uniformity theory in geology how can you have 2,000 years of death and decay and even destruction and violence when the Bible says by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin how can we read in as we did today in 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 by man came death so was there death in the world before sin I don't think so the Bible says death came by sin and that is a very powerful argument against the idea that there can be some great geological gap now why did why did men put the gap in there I said I was going to speak on this and I find this a little difficult to speak on because I know there are dear brethren here and sisters here who may be quite comfortable with the gap theory and as you know you're in good company I told you that earlier because the first person that I know that ever taught the gap theory was a man by the name of Mr. Thomas Chalmers and Dr. Chalmers, a Scottish evangelist, had the great privilege of preaching the gospel with great power and great blessing. And the sum of the souls he saw saved under his preaching have a tremendous lot to do with our history. For Duncan Matheson was saved through Dr. Chalmers. And Donald Ross was saved through Duncan Matheson. And Donald Ross is really the pioneer who brought the gospel to North America. So, you know, we're not, in, we're not finding any delight in, in saying that Dr. Chalmers was wrong. And not only did Dr. Chalmers teach the gap theory, but it was picked up by men of such caliber as Mr. Thomas Newbery, even Mr. William Kelly. And of course, don't be surprised that it's in the Schofield Bible. In fact, there are six notes in the Schofield Bible that teach the gap theory. And therefore, when I say that if you believe in the gap theory, you're in good company, I mean that. Well, here's what happened. At that time, the theories of Hutton and Lyle were current. People were swallowing the uniformity theory in geology that there were these great geologic ages in which all of this developed over the slow progression of centuries. 
And men who are not geologists, they didn't investigate it very closely. They didn't have reason to. But it was currently held and taught and believed, and so they found a way to explain it. We need to be awfully careful that we don't try to interpret the scriptures according to any new scientific theory. Because it won't be very long until science has changed their theories, and then what do we do with our explanation? So it's best just to go by what the scriptures say and let the word of God defend us. So now, uniformity, which is these this long ages of time that all the, the strata has been laid down and the fossils have been deposited and, and the world has been formed in the topography we know it to be in today, this is what is called unchanging change. That the forces that are now at work in our world have operated in the same form and with the same power through all these many, many geologic ages. I have shown you from Hebrews 11 and 3 that the Bible says not so that the Bible says the things which are were not made of things which do appear. I've tried to show you from Second Peter 3, and I'm repeating this because there are some here tonight that haven't been here in former meetings. From Second Peter 3, I've tried to show you that men say all things continue as they were. That's the unchanging change of uniformity. But they're willingly ignorant, willfully ignorant, that that's not true, that this world was formed not by unchanging change, but by tremendous upheavals, tremendous catastrophe. Of course, some of our dear brethren will say, well, well then there maybe was a catastrophe between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis. 1. Maybe there's another catastrophe there, but of course, Second Peter 3 doesn't mention that. Second Peter 3 only speaks of the, the great catastrophe of the days of Noah, when the world being overflowed with water perished. So it doesn't mention anything about a catastrophe between verses 1 and 2. Of course, many of our dear Christians are going to say, but what about Isaiah 45 and 18? Where it tells us that the world was not created, bohu, wa, tohu. Those are the two words that are used in Genesis 1 and verse 2. So Isaiah 45 and 18 says it wasn't made that way. And that is usually taken as the reason for believing that there was a disaster there. A terrible judgment. Usually, according to G.H. Pember and other teachers like him, that judgment happened because of the sin of Lucifer and angels. I never have been able to figure out why the sin of spirit beings would affect the physical realm. Because very obviously, when God made man, he made man the head of the physical realm. And when man sinned, the physical realm came down with him in the ruin that we know as the fall. So I've always had trouble understanding how the fall of a spirit being in heaven would ever affect this physical realm. How long before the fall of man did Satan fall? I don't know. But I have no reason from scripture to believe it was any great period of time at all. In fact, it may have been that when Satan fell, he immediately attacked the man that God had found such pleasure in. I was saying that to someone this afternoon, that any time God has ever said he had pleasure in anything, Satan attacked it. Way back in Genesis 3, as soon as God said he had pleasure in all he had made, and it pleased him, Satan was there. Job, hast thou considered my servant Job? Satan was there to attack him. And this is all the way through the Testaments. And when you come to the New Testament, here's an assembly at Thessalonica. And it pleases the Lord. And immediately Satan is there with evil doctrine to corrupt the assembly and with persecution to try to blot them out. I heard Mr. Wark, Mr. William Wark is one of our older preachers. I heard him preach that many, many years ago. Probably, uh, I've been saved over 60 years, so it was a long time ago. And I remember him saying that anything God has ever had pleasure in, Satan does his best to destroy. So I don't see there needs to be any great time between the fall of Satan and his coming into the garden in the form of the serpent to deceive Eve and to bring about the fall of man. Now, G.H. Pember wrote a book called Earth's Earliest Ages. And in that book he suggests that the fossil records go back to a former creation. That this present creation is not the original creation. If that is true, the Bible doesn't say so. 
I don't know what there was before the creation of Adam. I don't know. But there's nothing in the scripture, not a line anywhere to suggest that there was a creation before. Well, then you say, will you please explain that in Genesis 1 and verse 2, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Dark waters, an earth without form and void. Let me tell you what it means. The first verse tells of the creation of space. The heavens are space. God created the heavens. God created the earth. The word for earth actually means material substance. God created the materials out of which our world has come into being. God created the space of heavens. He created matter. So we are right when we say matter is not eternal. It had a beginning. God created it. The earth was without form and void. What does that mean? Bohu wa tohu. What does that mean? It means that it was not filled and it was not formed. Exactly what it means. Those two words, and this is from the best of Hebrew scholars, those two words, bohu and tohu, mean not formed, not filled. They really do not teach some kind of a disaster and destruction. So then... God begins to fill that which he intended to fill. All that Isaiah 45 and 18 says is that God didn't make it to be empty. That's all it says. God didn't make it to be unformed and empty. And, and, and that whole context in Isaiah 45 is about Israel inhabiting the land. So God said he didn't make the land to be empty. He didn't make creation to be empty. He created it to fill it. And so God has filled it and that's exactly what we have in all the verses that follow is God filling and forming this creation. It all happened in six days according to a number of statements in our Bible. Everything from verse 1 of Genesis 1 begins with an and. Do you know what that word is in, in the Old Testament? That's a consecutive connector. You ever notice that? You read the verses of Genesis 1? You know, I, I, I pretend to be an editor. <laughs> I tell you, if somebody sent me an article and, and every sentence began with an and, <laughs> it, would, it would come under the red pencil pretty strong. <laughs> we don't do that. We, we, don't, we don't write a whole essay that begins every sentence with an and. Why did God do that? This is God's word. Why did he do it? He was showing us that this is actually the order of the heavens and the earth. This is how they were created. In the six days in which God made heaven and earth and all the things that are in them. So the day-age theory does not hold water. Uh, I don't believe the gap theory is found here. So I do believe that what you have is that God made space, matter, time, and then order. Genesis 1 is teaching that in a very plain and simple way. Why is it that we have to think that we are so much wiser and, and can really interpret the Bible so differently? You see, up to the day that Hutton produced his great theory of uniformity, the general theory in geology was catastrophe. That was what was believed uh, throughout the world. Hutton suggested something different. And, of course, Charles Lyell came behind him uh, to make that a, a very strong thing. And Charles Lyell taught that this entire creation was gradually formed through these long processes called uniformity in geology. We're just going back to the simple word of God, that's all. I haven't tried to teach you science today. I just tried to teach you what the scriptures say. See, with all I've said, too many words maybe, but it just comes back to this. In the beginning, God. I want to say this. There might be some in the meeting here tonight who are not saved. Let me say this to you. If you can accept that very first statement of the Bible, then you'll have no difficulty accepting everything else that the Bible says. In the beginning, God. 
the moment men deny that first statement, they've denied it all. This is one thing about our Bibles that I'm sure many of you know. The Bible stands together. And sometimes when people say that the Bible is not a book of science and therefore you don't have scientific statements, wait a minute. If there is one flaw in the original writings, if the original autographs contain one single error in science, in grammar, or anything else, it's not the Word of God. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. What is the final, what is the final warning of Scripture? That all the judgments of that book of the Revelation will fall upon the person who adds to the things that are written in this book. That those judgments will fall upon the person who takes away from the things that are written in this book. In the book of the Revelation, we have a great religious system that adds to the things that are written in this book. In the book of the Revelation, we have a great political system that takes away from the things that are written in this book. Let me just close with one simple statement. Somebody won't, some of you won't be here tomorrow. Let me say this. The faith. The faith. What's that? It's the body of teaching about God, about the Trinity, about creation, about heaven, about hell, about sin, about the work of redemption, about the cross, about the resurrection, about the ascended Lord who lives in a real body in heaven, about the coming kingdom, about eternity, about the new heavens and the new earth. The faith, the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Here's something that will help some of you. Maybe this will be a help to you. What we believe in the Gospel Hall, can I say that? And you know what I mean by that? The Gospel Hall isn't what we belong to. It belongs to the Christians. But those who meet, as we do, what we believe is what has been believed by the apostles and by true Christians all down through the centuries. It hasn't been lost. It's always been held. And it has always held believers. I don't know if Christians do this very much. I've done it. Some of you have done it. I read the great creeds. You ever read the Nicene Creed? You ever read the Creed of Athanasius? The Nicene Creed was written in 325 A.D. The Athanasian Creed was written in, in uh, 357 A.D. Did you ever read the Apostles' Creed? Do you know what? It's the faith. Now, we don't, we, don't, we don't make much out of creeds like that. We don't go by those creeds because we believe we go by this, the book. Nevertheless, this is what those creeds tell us that there have been genuine believers who are faithful to the Word of God and the faith that we hold today, God has preserved it to us. I think it's a mighty miracle. I think it humbles us that God has preserved His truth to us. We don't have a new religion. It doesn't just belong to us. It's God's truth. It is the faith. And let me just say this at the close of this day. That faith says, in the beginning... God. In the beginning, God created from nothing. By creation, He said it was so. Shall we pray?